Hi there, guys. Uh, well, welcome back. This is 2C, and this is all about rational functions. And a subset of rational functions are reciprocal functions as well. So that's really the first thing which we're going to discuss in the questions, and then we're going to go on to more complicated rational functions and then find domains and ranges of, of uh, rational functions as well. Okay, well, first of all, what is a rational function? Well, me. What is a rational function? Well, here we go. Let's just back in here. So we're talking about a function which is a ratio of two polynomials. So is a fraction comprised of two polynomials, one on the numerator, one on the denominator. Now, when we're talking about polynomials, polynomials are things like ax squared plus bx c that would be a polyno polynomial of order two now a polynomial of order one would be a linear function ax plus b or mx plus c and a polynomial of order zero would just be a constant term so you'd have a x to the power of zero so the highest term the highest power on the x is the order of the polynomial okay so um, you could also have on here an extra plus something. Uh, you could say, for example, have an extra plus a on the end because you could essentially absorb this into these two functions here by creating this as over hx and over hx and then absorbing the two things as well. So it's okay to have uh, something on the end there, some sort of constant on the end. Okay, so that, that's a rational function. Let's just go to Desmos and have a look at a particular type of rational function. Now, this one is a reciprocal function. So reciprocal functions don't have, um, they don't have a polynomial on the top or rather they do have a polynomial, it's just a polynomial of order zero. So in other words, there's a constant term on the top. So these ones are really common. Um, so the most basic one which you, are probably aware of at the moment is this one here we've got f of x is equal to 1 over x and you can see that we have an asymptote at x is equal to 0 so that's your vertical asymptote that's where it's undefined if you put in 0 you don't get an answer out okay it's either infinitely large or infinitely small and so we don't know what that is and we have a, a horizontal asymptote here uh, as well which is y is equal to 0 so the horizontal asymptote is just this line here. That is to say, when x tends towards infinity, um, y tends towards zero. Likewise, if x tends towards negative infinity, y tends towards zero as well. Okay, well, that's a bit of limits, and I'm actually going to tag some work about limits onto the end of this uh, video too, so there'll be a little extra other than what the book is giving. Okay, so that's one over x. Uh, it's notable that, uh, let's have a look at some points. We get one, one, and we get two and 0 0.5, and we're getting four and 0 0.25. So, so um, this over to this side here, if we double the x value, then we need to half the y value. If we double the x value, we need to half the y value. And you might remember that that's also a case of direct, sorry, indirect proportion or inverse proportion. So if I came up with this one, so say, for example, I came up with 2 divided by x, that's in the form of indi indirect or inverse proportion. Remember inverse proportion? Let's just go back to this. So, for example, if I said that y is inversely proportional to x, I'd set it up like this, and that would be y is equal to k over x. Okay, and that's when you've got situations of inverse proportion like this one, with no squares on the bottom or no square roots involved, then if you double one of the variables, then you half the other one in the coordinate points. That's what we're just looking at here. Okay, uh, so there's another is another rational function uh, and another reciprocal function in fact so we've got two divided by x of course reciprocal functions are just 
uh, transformations of 1 over x. Now, if we double 1 over x, which of course is the reciprocal of x, so remember, reciprocal means x to the minus 1 is the reciprocal function. That's on the calculator, of course. So if I took the reciprocal of x, the reciprocal of x is 1 over x. Um, and we, all, we often talk about that in fractions as well when we talk about uh, dividing by a fraction is the same as timesing by its reciprocal. So dividing by two thirds is the same as timesing by three over two. Okay, just discussing the words. Okay, so here's another reciprocal function here. I've just um, transformed the original one. And you can see in this case, we still have the same horizontal asymptote y is equal to zero and vertical asymptote x is equal to zero as well. It's just that the coordinate points are now twice as far away from the x-axis. So we can change these functions as well if we decided to do one divided by let's say x minus one on the bottom there. You can see that this one has shifted across from the red graph by one unit to the right. So the Vertical asymptote is now at x is equal to 1. Horizontal asymptote is staying the same. Okay, so I've just put on x is equal to 1 just to show you the vertical asymptote there. Okay, and if maybe I called this one instead g of x, so we've got g of x on there, then we could also get that from f of x by saying f of x minus 1 would take us to g of x. So if you know about transformations, you'll know that by replacing x by x minus 1 inside a function, you'll shift the whole thing forwards by 1. Um, it's essentially, just a little bit on transformations, this is essentially saying, let's take all of the answers from one further back and place them where we are now. Okay, so for example, on the purple graph, when we choose the point uh, 2, 1, let's choose this point here, let's just make it clear. So the point 2, 1 is plotting the point from the original graph of 1, 1, one further ahead. So it's taking the value from 1 behind, okay, which is why we're replacing x by x minus 1. It's taking the value that came out of the graph from 1 behind at x minus 1 and plotting it at, at, at x. Okay, right, so there's, so that's kind of a uh, Ah, that's kind of interesting, I guess. Right, so we've got this x minus 1 on the bottom. We can now see that the, the asymptote here is, has changed. The vertical asymptote has changed to x is equal to 1. Okay, and, um, and that can be found by setting the denominator equal to 0. So we're basically asking, when do we get a 0 on the bottom here? So what value of x gives us a zero when we do something minus one uh, is equal to zero. So the answer is one, of course, so x is equal to one is the vertical asymptote. Okay, well, let's look at another transformation of this. If I put on the n tier g of x, let's put a plus two on here, you can see that your, your horizontal asymptote now shifts from uh, zero, y is equal to zero, to y is equal to two you'll never be able to get out a height of two on that green graph. So just the number at the end there represents your vertical, or your horizontal asymptote. Okay, uh, anything else to say with this? I think that's done. Basically, this is your main form for your uh, reciprocal functions. So I can stretch this thing by putting a three there, by putting a, a 1 there, or by putting a 0 0.5 there. And I can shift this forwards and backwards by changing the number at the bottom. And I can shift it up and down by changing the number at the end. OK, so there we go, let's just move it downwards. There we go, we've moved it down. OK, so that's reciprocal functions. And let's have a little look at the question in the book on this one. So example seven, let's make this a little bigger. Okay. 
So this one says determine the domain and range of the rational function y equals 2 over 1 minus x. Confirm your answer graphically and state the equations of the asymptotes. Okay, so um, I mean, your asymptotes are essentially going to tell you what your domain and range are. So let's look at the value that you can't put in for x because it will give you an undefined answer. And so your uh, so x, you can have any real number, but you can't have x is equal to 1 in this case, because 1 sorry, uh, is not equal to 1 there. You can't have 1 because 1 take away 1 gives you a 0 on the bottom, so you can't divide by 0. But that's going to be your domain, in which case your asymptotes are going to be x is equal to 1. So that's where we're undefined. And then for y, because there's no plus or minus anything on the end here, for y, this is just going to um, tend to, in, uh, as x tends to infinity, y is going to tend to zero. Um, so, yeah, if, if, I mean, you can imagine that, actually. If you put in, say, a really large number here, if you said x is a million, then 2 divided by almost a negative million. So two divided by something extremely large is going to become extremely small. So the bigger the denominator, the smaller your number. Okay, we're splitting it up to men, into many more pieces. Okay, so um, you could say that if you wanted to by saying the limit as x tends to infinity of two over one minus x um, is is uh, is equal to zero. That's another way of saying that our horizontal asymptote is y is equal to zero. Okay, so our range then as well is y belongs to the real numbers, but that y can't be equal to zero. Now it says confirm your answer graphically here. Um, well, normally in exams it's sufficient to come up with a sketch of the situation. Now, this is kind of an unusual question. I think it's unlikely that you'd see that question in the exam. I think here we might wish to plot this. So if you wanted to, you could come up with some numbers. You could come up with x is equal to, I don't know, let's say minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. And then you can come up with your y values. And then you can plot those values and you can put in your curves. Um, I would normally do this just by a sketch, though, by putting in the asymptote of x is equal to 1, and the asymptote here of y is equal to 0, we should define what x and y is, okay, and then putting in the shape of your graph. Now, I've probably come up with a couple of points on here as well, just because, you know, we want to get it sort of roughly right to scale. So when we put in 2, for example, we're getting 2, two divided by 1 minus 2, gives us minus two, so we're getting out an answer down here. And when we put in, say, for example, zero, when we put zero into this function, we're getting two divided by one, which gives us the height of two. So um, so we've got um, your asymptote here, so it's not defined here. We've got minus two here, we've got two here, and at minus one, probably going to go off the scale this one so 2 divided by um, 1 minus minus 1 gives us 2 oh no of course it doesn't give us 1 and then I think it's going to give us a half after that and so on okay so this is going to give us a 1 and let's just think what's it going to give us after that so if we put in a minus 2 so oh no we get 2 thirds there so this is 2 thirds OK, so we've got a graph which is looking like this and we've got a graph looking like this on the other side as well. So this would be sufficient to confirm your answer graphically. From my point of view, I would put in a sketch and then here I put in, especially where it's crossing the axis, that's important. But I put in a couple of other points there just to demonstrate that I completely get this. OK. Um, so there we go.
And now we're talking about rational functions. So here we go, rational functions. Let's get rid of some of this. Get rid of this here. So rational functions are talking about, um, as I said, a polynomial on the top and a polynomial on the bottom of the function. Now, they're in particular discussing here, steal this, they're discussing rational functions which consist of two linear polynomials. And normally the questions you get deal with linear polynomials because you can play around with them quite easily. Um, if you're talking about quadratic polynomials, then it's much more difficult to know what the shape of the graphs are, are looking like. Okay, so with these linear polynomials, we have the same uh, issue with these rational functions. We have this same issue about finding the number which you can't put in for x, the number which can't be in the domain. So um, the vertical asymptote is found quite quickly by setting the denominator equal to zero, just like before. So if we set cx plus d equal to zero, you will find your vertical asymptote. Now they say here a little, they come up with this little formula, x is equal to minus d over c. Now I wouldn't remember that. I think it's pretty obvious to know how to do this. You've just got to set the denominator equal to zero. That's the thing that I would remember because that's more of a universal skill. Okay, um, now the more complicated thing here is to work out what the horizontal asymptote is. So the horizontal asymptote here is not necessarily zero because we've got this plus zero on the end in this case. So it's not necessarily the number at the end. Um, so there's different ways in which you could do this. Um, but the way in which they suggest you to do this is to rearrange this to make x the subject. And then essentially that's going to give you your inverse function. So you can put in your value of y to go back and get your value of x. That's essentially your inverse function. So that's going to take us back to this uh, function here. So what we, what we end up doing is replacing this by y, if you remember, and then replacing your y's by x if you remember that's from before okay but i will go through this in an example and that's going to end up giving you your inverse function in terms of x okay um well perhaps that's not too clear there but you might have done that before but let's have a bit of question so example eight Okay, so determine the domain and range of this function, right? So the domain is really straightforward. We need to go, we need to set 1 minus 3x equal to 0, and we'll see that we get 1 is equal to 3x, and so x is 1 over 3. So our domain is x belongs to our real numbers, but x is not allowed to be equal to a third. Otherwise, we get a divide by 0 there. Okay, so for the next bit, that, so that is done. But for the next bit, we've got, um, we've got to rearrange this thing here to make x the subject. So let's take 1 minus 3x equals 2x minus 1. We've got 1 minus 3xy equals 2x minus 1. And you should have done these type of uh, rearrangements previously in previous courses. But here we go, let's take x, uh, y over to the other side, and then we can factorize out the x. So we've got 2 plus 3y there, y plus 1. And so then we've got x is equal to the y plus 1 divided by 2 plus 3y. Okay. So that means to say that if we put in our y value, we will get backwards to our x value. So instead of going forwards, we're going backwards here. We're taking the y value and we're coming out with the x value. Now, when we were looking for the domain, when we were looking for the vertical asymptote, um, we were trying to put in x values 
which wouldn't give us out a defined answer for y. So now we want to know the y value, which is not going to give us a defined value for x. Okay, that's kind of tricky, the wording there, but basically we want to just set the denominator of this equal to zero. Now I'm just going to take this a little further. The book doesn't do this, but you probably already know, and if you don't, you're now finding out that this is your inverse function. So if f of x is equal to this thing here, so I've re just replaced y by f of x, then the inverse function here, in other words, the going backwards function, is to put a number in and get the, get the original number out. Now we're calling that x as the input because I've just defined it as f of x. So um, this is basically just the backwards function. Now the backwards function, again, is not defined when we have this denominator equal to zero. So we've, uh, two plus three y is equal to zero leads to the fact that we have y is equal to minus two over three. So we're saying that the domain, so I'm gonna write this just down over to this side. The domain of the inverse function, or rather the range of the original function is y belongs to the real numbers but y cannot be equal to minus two over three. So there's the range and there's the, there's the domain for this. Okay, uh, it says confirm your answer graphically. Well, I think I might skip this one, just see what they've done on this. Um, see the way they've, they've defined the range there, they've just put it in set notation. It is fine the way I've written it, in fact, probably more correct the way I've written it because they haven't defined y to be a real number there. So really, I think they should say in this section here, let's just steal this. Okay. So here, I would say y belongs to the real numbers such that either a line or a dot dot for such that, such that y is not equal to, or under these conditions essentially, y is not equal um, minus two thirds. Okay, so that's our range. But the way which we way in which we wrote it was fine by just saying y belongs to these numbers, and then y cannot be to this thing here. Okay, uh, so there we go. Um, and there's your graph, and that's the verification graphically. Again, I would probably start off by doing the two asymptotes of course we have the asymptote at minus two thirds and i would be really clear saying where this crosses the axis and we had the vertical asymptote what was the vertical asymptote again vertical asymptote was a third okay so we should say that this is a third here and then i would actually come up with some coordinate points just to be really clear, in particular, the one I care about is where does it cross the x-axis and where does it cross the y-axis? The other thing is, if you were just going to sketch this in, you might actually just think about sketching that side and that side instead. So you just want to make sure that you've got the right two sides of this as well. So I would put in x and y and then just come up with a couple of numbers either side, probably minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. Come up with those coordinate points and just plot those ones as well. Um, that might actually not give you where this crosses at zero. Mm, this is probably sufficient in this case, to be honest. It, normally, if you're doing a, a sketch of a graph, and it doesn't ask for a sketch here, but normally when you're doing a sketch of a graph, you're looking for where does it cross all of the axes? So where the x-axis intercepts, where's the y-axis intercept? Sometimes where are the turning points? It depends if the question asks you for that but definitely the shape of, of the graph as well. Okay, so the, the ambiguity with the question really was the question said, confirm your answer graphically. It didn't say, come up with a sketch. You see, because coming up with a sketch is just using the information which we already have. Confirming your graph graphically would really require you to plot some values as well. And as I said before, confirming your answer graphically is an unlikely exam question. Normally they'll say, sketch this, or plot this between these points. Okay, right, so I was gonna do one extra thing, so I can see that they're actually coming up to the exercise now. So I was gonna do one extra way of finding the, 
the uh, horizontal asymptote here. So let's just take the question again. And this is actually quicker. So this is why I'm doing this, and I'm going to deal with some limits. Now, I, I can think of two other ways of doing this. One is a division of polynomials, but we haven't got onto division of polynomials just yet. So I'm not going to deal with that. But the other way is dealing with limits. Now, limits is pretty simple. At least pretty simple to see what the answer is, but like a proper working through the limits is slightly harder. So what do I mean? I mean, what I'm looking for for the horizontal asymptote is what does this function become when x tends towards infinity or negative infinity? So we're getting out 2x minus 1, 1 minus 3x as our function here. Now, imagine what happens when x is 100 to start off with. Well, this number at the top is going to be very near to 200, and this is going to be very near to minus 300. Okay, and as I take 1,000 there, the answer on the top is going to be very near to 2,000. It's going to be, going to be very near to 3,000. In fact, it's going to get closer as a uh, it's going to get closer to 2000 as a sort of percentage difference from what it actually is. What do I mean by that? I mean that the minus one and the plus one are going to become increasingly insignificant as X gets larger. So in other words, you can kind of ignore this and this and just take your highest uh, powers of X those terms and so this is going to become just 2x divided by 3x because this and this are going to become insignificant and therefore as a minus 3x but it's positive and then we can cancel the x's so there we go we're left straight away with minus with 2 over minus 3 so that's a much quicker way of getting to your horizontal asymptote now that's not really a proper um, rigorous way of using the limits. What what I would do next, actually, here, if I was going to do this more rigorously, is just to say, let's divide that top line by x, and let's divide the bottom line by x over x minus 3. Okay, so I've divided the top line, and I've divided the bottom line by x. Um, and now, as x tends towards infinity, I can bring that in here, so it's equal to the top line. So I can bring that in here, and this is using our laws of limits, and we can say, well, that's the same as the limit of the top line divided by the limit of the bottom line, but the limit of two doesn't involve x, so that's just two. So we can say the limit of x tending to infinity of minus, taking the minus out, one over x, and the limit of x tending to infinity of 1 over x again on the bottom minus 3. Now we can see that that's 2 minus 0 divided by 0 minus 3, which is also giving us minus 2 thirds. But we know that as x tends to infinity, 1 over x is going to become 0. Okay, 1 divided by something extremely large is going to become 0. So this is a more formal way of, of treating the limits here. But either way, this is a really quick way of getting our uh, horizontal asymptote, and that's not mentioned in the book here. Okay, uh, well, the exercise only has six questions. Next, we're on to radical functions. Thanks for listening, guys, and I'll see you for the next one.